Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So my name is Sarah Gutchow. I'm a senior planner at PSRC and welcome everyone to our 2023 Transportation Alternatives Program Workshop. Um, so before we start, I'm going to go through a few housekeeping items, which you just saw on the previous screen. So firstly, I know we get this question a lot. So I wanted to emphasize that this uh, workshop will be recorded. And then we will be posting the recording on our website along with the presentation slides after the workshop. Um, so this is a listen only workshop. It's more set up as a webinar. So you will not need to turn on your microphone or your camera. So you do not need to use the raise hand feature, although I know it's available to attendees. But if you have any questions or comments and that includes any technical questions, please just go ahead and use our Q&A function so you can uh, submit any questions you have there, and then PSRC staff will review them, and then we will wait until the Q&A portion at the end of the workshop to go through them. But we can pause earlier if needed, if there's anywhere where it's helpful to clarify what we're going over as part of the presentation. And then lastly, uh, this presentation is really just going over the highlights and kind of high-level overviews of the information available. There's a lot more information available on our TAP webpage on the PSRC website. Uh, so if you'd like to look there, everything we're presenting is there as well. Uh, so we'll be going over that at the end, um, what we have on our TAP webpage. But just wanted to mention here that that information is there as well. So um, I just introduced myself, but before we get started, I wanna go just a quick round of introductions for our panelists from PSRC staff. So I'll start with uh, Nick Johnson. Hello, everyone. My name is Nick Johnson. I am an assistant planner on the transportation planning team at PSRC. Great. We have Jennifer Barnes. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Barnes, and I'm a program manager in the transportation planning department. Brian. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Lee. I'm in the data department program manager for data solutions and research. Great. Thanks, Brian. And then we have Mitch. Hello, my name is Mitch Cook, and I work in the transportation planning department as a transportation, or sorry, associate planner. Thanks, Mitch. And then lastly, we have Alexa. Would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Alexa. I'm an admin for our transportation department. And Alexa has been probably answering some of your emails if you've emailed us ahead of time. So to get started, um, so as I mentioned, we're gonna start off with an overview of the Transportation Alternatives Program um, in general, and then we'll go through program eligibility for sponsors and program activities. And then we'll talk about funding availability as well as requirements. Um, then we'll go through all the evaluation criteria in more detail and talk about uh, what is there and how to meet each criteria and how to score well on your application. Um, and then we'll talk about the schedule and next steps. And lastly, I'll turn it over to Nick Johnson to go over the resources available and then also the application. So he'll do a walkthrough of that. <clears throat> so to start off with, the Transportation Alternatives Program is a set aside uh, that is under the Federal Highway Administration. Pro uh, Federal Highway Administration. Um, so it is used for community-based transportation improvements. Uh, so we've categorized all the different eligible activities into three different buckets for our evaluation criteria purposes. So that's uh, pedestrian and bicycle facilities, historic preservation of transportation assets, and then environmental mitigation. Uh, so we'll be talking in a moment about what is included for eligible activities for each of these categories. Um, but as mentioned, there's a lot more detail in the uh, resources available on the website as well. So to start off with, uh, talking about what generally our project selection process is and how it works. Uh, so we uh, so we sent out our call for projects a couple weeks ago. Um, so now we're at the portion where sponsors are submitting their screening forms and applications. Um, so once sponsors submit their project applications, they next go to be evaluated by PSRC staff. So we use the evaluation criteria and score projects on a scale of zero to 100. Um, and then we take all of our scores and we submit them to our project selection committee. So the project selection committee for TAP is a little bit different from some of our, our main Federal Highway Administration uh, dollars uh, project selection processes. 
We have an ad hoc committee that we form each uh, TAP process. Uh, so our last TAP process was in 2021. Um, so for this one, we'll be uh, forming it again, and we're working on that right now. Um, but generally speaking, the structure of that committee is that we have representatives from each of the countywide forums for the four counties that make up the PSRC region, uh, Kitsap, Pierce, Snohomish, and King. Um, and then we also have representatives from our Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee at PSRC. So once the committee meets and makes its recommendation, they will next send that recommendation to our Transportation Policy Board, who will review it and then make their recommendation to the Executive Board. Um, and then PSRC's Executive Board will make the final funding decisions. And then uh, once those final funding decisions are made, we'll be working with sponsors on their TIP applications um, and also sending out award letters. Um, so the final step in the process, process is that the awarded projects will be approved into this TIP. So this is really an overview of how the project selection process works in general. Um, and as part of one of the last slides, we'll be going over the schedule and the upcoming dates and next steps and everything you might need to know for applying to the program. So as mentioned, uh, we have a lot of different eligible activities for TAP. Um, there's a, it's an interesting diverse mix of what can qualify as eligible. Uh, so to start off, our first category is uh, uh, bicycle and pedestrian projects. So under here, we have, generally speaking, improvements to uh, bicycle, pedestrian, and shared use facilities. Um, but for TAP, that also includes any safety and educational activities that are eligible under the Safe Routes to School program. Uh, so one thing to mention here, if you're already have, are familiar with the program and have previously applied, is that there were a few changes under the bipartisan infrastructure law to eligibility, uh, generally speaking, to expand eligibility. Uh, so for safe routes to school, now rather than K through eight, it is now uh, K through 12, any school and K through 12 is eligible. So it doesn't have that restriction anymore. Um, and then there was also an expansion for one more activity um, under uh, bicycle and pedestrian, which is for vulnerable road user safety assessments. So a, a um, applicant can apply to do one of those as well for, with using the TAP funds. So for historic resources, uh, generally the types of activities here would be historic preservation or rehabilitation of <coughs> historic preservation facilities. <clears throat> so what that means is that for an example would be a restoration of transit vehicles, historic transit vehicles. Um, we've had previous applicants uh, use funds for historic bridges or uh, things of that nature, train museums. Um, <clears throat> the, this category also has archeological activities that would be connected to impacts from a transportation projects, such as archeological activities necessary for a highway building or a transit project, like building a new subway system. And then lastly, we, we have environmental projects. Um, so under here, we have vegetation and stormwater management. FHWA generally defines the vegetation management as preventing invasive species or erosion control measures. We have uh, the category of protection of wildlife. So this could be something like removing a fish passage barrier or um, building a wildlife bridge. You could also use these funds under this category for constructing a viewing area or regulating um, outdoor advertising. So a pretty wide range of uh, what types of activities that would be considered eligible. But I should also mention what would not be eligible. So generally speaking, what would not be eligible for the funds are transit and roadway capacity projects. So anything for increasing the, the capacity of a roadway or transit system. Generally, uh, maintenance and operations are not eligible um, except in some uh, circumstances where trail maintenance could be eligible if it's an activity allowed under the recreational trails program. And then also recreational facilities that do not serve a transportation purpose, such as building a playground or a, a pavilion within a park, unless that purpose was an activity that's uh, allowed under the TAP or the recreational trails program or safe routes to school. But otherwise, generally uh, recreational facilities that only serve one location like a park are not eligible. Um, there's also a lot of information that FHWA produces that has more detail on what kind of trail projects are eligible and how to show that they serve a recreational purpose. 
Um, but the FHWA uses a closed loop standard. So a path that only goes within one park and does not serve, would not be considered as serving a transportation purpose. So it needs to be connecting destinations within an area. So I'll pause here. Was there anything, um, any questions, Jennifer, that we would wanna check in on? So we have a question, uh, to, a clarification question. Um, are any activities associated with a transit expansion project? Are are there any? I think it's are they are there any that are not eligible for any of the categories? Uh, yeah. So generally, transit expansion projects would not be eligible for TAP funding. So yeah, that I yeah I don't know if that was clear, but uh, yeah. So those would be things that would not be eligible. Would be any transit expansion or roadway expansion um, of capacity projects. Thanks. Okay. okay. So here's eligible activities. Um, this slide talks about eligible sponsors. Uh, so there's also a lot of uh, eligible sponsors here. So there's a wide range of activities eligible as well as sponsors. Uh, Generally, public agencies are eligible, so that includes cities and towns, tribes, ports, counties, transit agencies. Um, so to the last question, transit agencies are eligible, but only for anything that would count as eligible activity under the previous categories just discussed. Um, school districts are also eligible, <clears throat> and under the BIL, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, that now includes school districts or schools that would be serving um, K through 12, not just K through 8. Um, and then lastly, I'll mention nonprofit entities are eligible. Uh, this is a new thing under the bipartisan infrastructure law. Previously, nonprofit entities were only eligible um, under the specific circumstance of if they were responsible for administering um, a transportation safety program. Um, but the BIL uh, made nonprofit entities eligible in general. So we are still working on our end to make sure we understand exactly what that means and what the eligibility requirements are uh, for nonprofit entities. Um, but we are taking that they would need to also be partnering with a certification acceptance agencies. So if they to apply for funds. So we are working to confirm that with WashDOT, but just wanted to mention that this is an expansion um, that we are still looking into. So, so this slide is about plan consistency requirements. Um, so for all projects seeking funds at PSRC, they need to be consistent with our regional transportation plan as well as vision 2050. Uh, so that is a basic eligibility requirement that we ask is that um, they are both consistent with the regional plan as well as their city or county comprehensive plans, um, which means that, uh, that yeah, oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> basically, all our processes at PSRC, from our highest level of Vision 2050, and then our regional transportation plan, all funnel down into our project selection processes. So our evaluation criteria really reflect what's in our regional transportation plan in terms of regional goals and our transportation planning into the future. Um, so I'll stop there. Jennifer, did you have anything to add on this slide for plan consistency? Yeah, I'll just pipe in a little bit on the regional transportation plan. Uh, to be consistent with the regional transportation plan, uh, projects can fall into one of two major buckets, basically. So we have thresholds that we've defined where a project that is above this threshold uh, is considered a regional capacity project. And for any project that is considered a regional capacity project, it needs to be explicitly listed in the project list that is included in our regional transportation plan. Uh, so some examples are capacity improvements on uh, a principal arterial. And, uh, and I shouldn't say capacity, capacity changes on a principal arterial. So, so, and that can include increasing capacity, but it can also include decreasing capacity. So say a bike, a, a, a Principal arterial is going to be rechannelized to add a bike lane and take out a vehicle lane. That would be a capacity change that would meet our threshold for regional capacity project. It would need to be listed. The other 
And, and we have very specific thresholds that identify you know, what is considered a regional capacity project. Uh, the reason for this is these projects, they have to be listed as um, what we call candidate or approved or in the, in the or actually it would be candidate at this point, but they need to be part of our financially constrained list. These are all included in our air quality conformity modeling. And so they are you know, included under the umbrella of, of the RTP. Uh, projects that are under this threshold, uh, the thresholds that are defined in our uh, four regional capacity projects, we consider programmatic. So if a project doesn't meet the threshold for regional capacity project, uh, but meets all of the other criteria that Sarah has been talking about, that is considered consistent with the regional transportation plan. It's programmatic, even though it's not explicitly listed. And so that one would be good to go. Uh, some examples and a lot of the projects that are submitted for TAP are that type of project. It could be sidewalk connections, uh, bicycle facilities or, or pedestrian facilities on, uh, on a street that's a lower classification than principal arterial. The screening form uh, resource document has a link to a summary of the thresholds for regional regionally significant projects. It also has a link to the list of projects that are listed. And if anybody has any question about, uh, about your project's consistency with the regional transportation plan after reading through our guidance, just don't hesitate to reach out to Mitch or me and we can answer any questions that you have. Great, thanks, Jennifer. And <clears throat> just wanted to reiterate, as Jennifer mentioned, there are resources available. We have our checklist document that's on the TAP webpage that links to all the resources that Jennifer just mentioned. And we will be checking for this when we review your screening forms once they're submitted later this month. So moving on to available funding, we have a large amount of funding um, compared to previous processes for this funding cycle. So for this funding cycle, we are uh, distributing 2024, 2025, and 2026 dollars. And we have a total of 24 million available and on your screen, you can see how it's broken out by year. <clears throat> so we have 7 million for 2024 and then 8.3 million for each of the years 25 and 2026. So for each, um, when you're submitting your, I think just your application, maybe screening form too, um, you should be also selecting your preferences for your first and second uh, preferences for years. Um, so we will take that into consideration at the end of the process once we select projects for balancing the funds by year. <clears throat> so as in our last process in 2021, uh, we do have some limitations for funding requests. Uh, so the first is that we are limiting uh, two applications per agency. Um, so if you have, for example, two departments within an agency, we'd ask that you would coordinate and only submit two applications total for the agency. Um, there is also a 2.5 million request limit per each project. Um, and then for similar to all of our federal highway and other FTA uh, funding processes, requests are limited to either a single phase or PE and design plus one phase. So as an example, you could submit a request for PE design and then also for right of way or PE design and then also for construction. So let's see. Uh, for so generally speaking, um, this isn't on the slide, but as with all our processes, um, all sponsors will need to uh, fulfill all state and federal requirements when submitting their applications. So that includes, but is not limited to what you see on your screen. Um, so as with other federal highway funds, there's a 13.5% match requirement. Um, and then we also need sponsors to show that there's full funding for all project phases and that funds are secured or reasonably expected. Um, and then as with our other federal highway processes, um, the obligation deadline for all the funds is June 1st of the program you're awarded. So if you're asking for 2024 funds, then the due date would be June 1st, 2024. And then lastly, I'll mention that when you submit your screening form, um, we ask that you submit the complete packet of paperwork with a screening form and not not that you don't need to submit the formal authorization just right, just yet. Did I get that right, Jennifer? Yes. And okay. Sarah, we had a, just a quick clarification question. Somebody asked if if a sponsor can apply for design only 
Um, and just want to clarify that yes, any of the, any of the phases can be uh, you can apply for singly. There's just the PE plus one if if you want to apply for two phases. Yes, and I didn't uh, mention it, but you can also apply for a planning phase as well. And we also have a quick clarification question asking about full funding. Uh, if that is, applies only to the phases for which you're requesting funding, and the answer is yes to that. So if you're requesting funds for PE, uh, you would need to show that funds are secured or reasonably expected for that phase that you are requesting. But say you are requesting for PE plus construction, then you would need to show funds secured or reasonably expected uh, for both of those phases. And uh, this is another area where we have very detailed guidance in the resources for what uh, what the requirements are to show funds as secured or as reasonably expected. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Okay, so moving on to the evaluation criteria. <clears throat> so this slide shows the total point values uh, for all the evaluation criteria. Um, but just want to start by uh, clarifying that. So we have criteria for all projects. So we have support for centers and project readiness and each have their own point values, but that totals to 40 points. Um, and then we have category specific criteria. So once you get to that point in the application, you'll choose the different um, category that you uh, that your project falls under um, and then go to the specific questions for that criteria. But all types of projects are weighted equally. They're all 60 points. So the criteria is tailored to each type of project, um, but they're all 60 points for the category specific criteria. So the application will allow you to branch at the point um, you get there. And Nick will show how this will work once he walks through the application after my presentation. And then lastly, we have other considerations, which is additional information, which might be helpful for um, illustrating your project, but these are not uh, valued under our point value system. So to start off uh, with our criteria for all projects, um, the first is support for centers, that's 30 points. Um, so this is where you can show that uh, your project has um, support for existing and planned housing and employment densities, um, and that your uh, project is there to support a center. Um, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this yet, but uh, for TAP, the, uh, what we define as a center is not just uh, regional growth centers. It includes regional growth centers, but also manufacturing industrial centers, as well as local centers. Uh, so there's resources available in the checklist to find out more information about what the regional growth centers are, but they do not show what the local centers would be if you have questions about that. For that, you'd have to look at uh, locally available resources. So for here, uh, we're looking for data on specifically what, how your project would support uh, specific policies that you can cite in a comprehensive plan for the area. So an example of this would be if you have a policy for redeveloping streets within a housing within a center to be more active transportation friendly, um, then you could show that a bicycle pedestrian project would go to support this by building new sidewalks or bike lanes. Um, and then from the other categories, a historic resource project could be used to support economic development goals or also general goals for historic uh, preservation that your uh, comprehensive plan might have. Um, and then an environmental project could be used to show stormwater management goals or to support um, also um, environmental, um, yeah, or management of the natural environment goals. Um, and for here, we're looking for um, you to make sure you're supporting specific policies and create a clear nexus between how the project supports that. Um, and then for the uh, support for development and redevelopment of plans and Titties. Um, we're looking for uh, showing current developments, developments you have underway. And then you could also use a support for this long range planning studies that you're looking at for looking at how to build out your center. Um, for project uh, readiness, we just talked a bit about what the financial requirements are, but here this is worth 10 points. And here we're really looking to see how the project will be ready to use the PSRC funds by the requested deadline. So the June 1st deadline we just talked about. Um, so we're looking for what the schedule is for the prerequisites for obligation, and then also project milestones, um, and then supporting information for the project budget and the financial plan. So this, once again, uh, goes for all projects. Um, and then once you complete that portion, 
um, will go to the category specific criteria, which is tailored to different types of projects. Um, so for the pedestrian bicycle projects, um, should mention that this is 60 points total, but we've broken it out into three subcategories. The first one is circulation, mobility, and accessibility, which is a total of 42 points. Um, and the first bullet point here is, and um, these are all weighted equally, I should mention, um, unless otherwise noted, um, all the point values are equal for all the bullet points you'll see. Um, so the first one is how, showing how the project extends or the bicycle and pedestrian uh, system or network. Um, for this one, a way to score higher would be to be very specific about how the project connects into the existing facility network. So citing the, the specific facilities. Um, and for this, in terms of what would score more highly um, would be what would something that would complete a network uh, would score a bit more highly than something that is starting a network. So completing a network usually will score um, a little better. Um, for addressing community needs, um, for this one, we're really looking for you to paint a very clear picture of what the need is and how the project specifically addresses that need. Um, for example, a need for closing gaps in a system where there are gaps in a sidewalk network, um, or doing other things to improve existing facilities or otherwise improve um, pedestrian and bicyclist safety and comfort. Something like reducing a steep grade or removing barriers would be helpful here. Um, and to demonstrate community need, uh, one way that previous applicants have done this is by talking about community support, um, public meetings they've had, or other investments that they've been making to help address this need. Um, for providing connections to transit, uh, we have a very large emphasis in our regional transportation plan and our regional planning in general on improving access to transit. Um, so for this, the projects that will score more highly are ones that really improve access to transit by, for example, building active transportation facilities in a transit uh, supportive area or building your transit stations. Um, so one way you can provide um, supportive information here is by talking about the actual transit routes and the stops and stations that serve the area. So rather than just saying that this project is served by bus service or light rail service, talking a lot about what the transit stops and stations are, how many routes are served will be helpful. Um, for providing public access and benefits to various user groups, here we're asking about, does the project provide public access and which uh, user groups will benefit um, from the project? <clears throat> and once again, um, specif specificity is helpful here. Um, so not just saying this will help older adults, but talking about a specific population or just saying residents, um, talking about older adults that live in, for example, a retirement community nearby the project that will be able to use the new sidewalks um, to access medical services or, um, met, or food services that are nearby the project. Um, and then lastly, uh, the bullet point for loss of opportunity if not funded, and this will go for the, um, the next two categories as well. Um, here we're talking about something like development pressure that is going to create pressure to build this facility in a timely manner. And if the project is not funded, it will not benefit from that or it will not be able to address that need. Um, so moving to um, the next subcategory under uh, pedestrian bicycle projects. Um, so first I'll start off by talking about our equity work at PSRC. Uh, so for our regional transportation plan, which we adopted last year, um, equity was a major area of emphasis. We did a lot of work to improve our analysis of different equity populations. Um, and then we're doing a lot of uh, work at PSRC in general for our regional equity plan uh, strategy um, and other work. Um, and so as part of our data work, we in our regional transportation plan, we identified uh, equity population groups, which you'll see on your screen of, I'll just read out people of color, people with low incomes, uh, little, older adults, people with disabilities, youth, and people with limited English proficiency. Um, so the resource map illustrated here, um, this is also included um, or linked to, and I think it's one of the links on the, uh, the TAP webpage. Um, so here you can see uh, each of those populations 
highlighted for the equity focus areas. So what that means is areas that have a higher concentration of each of those populations compared to the regional average. So Nick will walk you through this um, in a few minutes, so I won't go too far into this, but this is one of the resources you could use for our equity criteria. Um, so we have 10 points for equity criteria. One is to, the first one is to identify the different population groups. So those would be the ones identified here. And there's a few other listed in the criteria um, and really talking about how the project would address disparities or gaps for those groups. So since we're talking about pedestrian and bicycle projects specifically, that could be talking about how a sidewalk project addresses uh, gaps in the sidewalk network in an area with a high number of people of color or people with low incomes. But here we're really asking you to identify the groups and then how the project addresses those groups. Then the next bullet is to describe the public outreach process for how the project was developed and how that public outreach process was used to talk to those groups specifically and get their uh, feedback on the project and get um, really their input on developing the project. And then lastly, identifying the displacement risk. Um, so this is another resource that we have a lot of data for on our website. Um, that we have a displacement risk map. Uh, so for this question, what we're asking you to do is go to our displacement risk map and identify for the area, whether the area in question is, could be, is identified as an area of high, medium, or low displacement risk. Um, and if it's a high or medium a displacement risk, then you will need to talk about mitigation strategies to address those risks here. So that is how you can score more highly is if you can kind of fully address each of these bullet points. Um, so I can pause here for questions or I can wait till the end till I think um, Nick will go over this and then we have uh, Brian and Nick to talk a little bit more about the data we used here. Sarah, I think we can just keep going. Oh, okay. sure. Noting okay. questions for Q&A. Okay. Great, thanks Jennifer. So <clears throat> another area of high emphasis in the regional transportation plan and our current work in transportation at PSRC is safety. We are currently at work on our regional safety plan, or we're about to start work on that, I should say. Um, and then we have a regional safety summit coming up shortly later this month on June 29th. Um, <clears throat> so as part of that, um, as I uh, talked about earlier, the, the project selection is really kind of the bottom of the funnel for our different planning processes. And this is where you can see that we've improved the, or really strengthened the criteria for equity and safety. So for safety, we have eight points total, um, and we're asking for you to talk about specifically how your project addresses safety for pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, so for addressing safety and security, here's a place where um, data is really helpful, talking about the specific safety issues in an area. Um, so you can talk about <clears throat> why the facility currently is unsafe or why new facilities are needed to address the safety risk. Um, you can talk about crash data for the area, um, but being specific about why what's unsafe and how the project addresses that. Um, and here for how the project improves uh, pedestrian bicyclist safety, um, one thing that will help you score more highly is, for example, if you're building a bike lane project, we're looking for um, <clears throat> a project that provides more separation from the roadway, like a protected bike lane will tend to score higher than something that does not provide as much separation, like a striped bike lane or a shared um, road marking. <clears throat> For addressing policies from adopted safety plan, um, <clears throat> this could be a local safety plan. We've also had applicants cite a state plan or um, <clears throat> the state safety plan here. Um, and then to clarify what we mean by reduced reliance on enforcement or design for decreased speeds, what we're really getting at here is how the design of the project will, or other measures, um, can help make it so that the users will, will, safety will be achieved without needing enforcement. So traffic coming, for example, um, so there's less reliance on uh, monitoring and more just on the road itself leading to greater safety benefits. Um, for historic resources, um, first we are talking about uh, for the history of uh, the facility and providing transportation. Um, so we get questions here on what would be considered a historic, uh, what would be considered a project under this category. So as I mentioned, um, something like a historic bridge, historic railroads um, for 
or we've also had projects for improving um, pedestrian facilities that are in a historic district if they can be tied uh, specifically to the historic nature of the district. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> and for the current and planned use of the facility related to transportation, um, this could be a historic railroad providing rides to visitors or a museum of historic uh, transportation assets like trains. For historic significance of the project being preserved, um, for this one, we're lo really looking for how the project is uh, providing, is, is part of a designated as a local, state, or national landmark or is contributing part of a historic district. Um, and then for whether the project is an historic preservation plan, um, this could also be a seismic uh, retrofit program um, for public access. Um, once again, a museum could be providing access to the public or a historic bridge could be providing access to the public. And we're also looking for how that project would um, also serve different user groups um, similar to the last category. Um, and then lastly, for the long-term preservation maintenance plan, uh, details here that would be helpful would be who is responsible for administering the plan um, and links to the plan and kind of the long-term benefits or the long-term goals of the plan. Um, for environmental, um, this is another one uh, where we get some questions on what would count as uh, eligible for this category. So this would be things like removal of fish passage barriers, uh, water quality retrofits, uh, flood control measures, wildlife crossings of highways. Um, and for this one, I'll call it the bullet point for how the project goes above and beyond normally required environmental mitigation. Um, an example of this would be if you're constructing a new transportation project, if you're ensuring that that construction has minimal impacts to fish and wildlife, that could be an example of that. <clears throat> Other considerations, as mentioned, this is uh, worth zero points total, um, and this is not scored, but we're looking here for any additional aspects of the project that might be relevant as we review your project, um, but this is, does not have a specific point value, um, but you could provide here more information about your public review process and different actions used to involve the public and other stakeholders as you're developing the project. So before I move on, are there any questions about the evaluation criteria, Jennifer? Uh, no, I think we can keep going. Okay. Great. Okay, so for next steps, uh, we have our project screening forms due to PSRC on June 26th. Um, so I'll pause here to talk about what the screening forms are because we did not have screening forms um, as part of the previous process. So this is a little bit new for TAP, but we thought it was important to include screening forms because this is really where we check eligibility and have the screening forms ask all the eligibility questions that would be relevant to see if your project is actually eligible um, to apply for the program. So if it falls into the categories we just talked about, but then also the other information about plan consistency, or we also look at your financial documentation to make sure that not just the uh, <clears throat> your financial documentation, but also that your project, the request fits those uh, limitations of the 2.5 million limitation uh, per application and then two applications for agency. So we will be working on all that as part of our project screening form process um, that will be coming up shortly. So the coming up on June 26th, um, which is I think in two weeks, um, we will be uh, looking at your project screening forms um, and then we will be um, once we finish our review, we'll be providing comments back to you, I think the second week of June. Um, and one thing to note here is that when you start your actual application, um, those, the, what you include in your screening form will be already included in your application. So you'll be able to modify what's there based on our comments where needed, um, but that information will already be included in the application, so you won't have to fill it out twice. The next step is that um, once you've had the opportunity to address any comments, the actual project applications will be due to PSRC on July 21st. Um, after that, PSRC staff will be working to score the projects before sending our scores to the project selection committee, um, which will be meeting in late August. Um, and then the projects will next go to our transportation policy board in September, be released for public comment, 
Um, and then any public comments received will be submitted to the Transportation Policy Board for its October meeting. Um, the Transportation Policy Board will provide its final recommend, its funding recommendation to the Executive Board, and the Executive Board will be making the final approval for project funding. Um, and then finally, uh, after that, the funds will be approved into the state tip in mid-November. Um, PSRC will be issuing awards, um, award letters at that uh, after the Executive Board approval. Um, we will also be working with each project sponsor on their TIP applications um, once the funds have been awarded. Um, and I should also mention that in addition to coming up with the final recommendation, we will have a contingency list for projects. Um, and then for the projects on the contingency list, they will be eligible to for any TAP funding that becomes available after this award. So I think that's almost my last slide. So um, before turning over to Nick, um, Nick will be walking through the online materials available on the TAP webpage. So we've talked a lot about them, so I won't talk too much here, but we have our eligibility information. Um, we have the project evaluation criteria, which is everything I talked about here, um, but we also have a lot of guidance there. Um, we have the actual screening form and application portal, um, and then we have some additional resources as support for helping with your applications and really I'm pointing you to where to look at if as you're filling out your applications um, to know <clears throat> any kind of supporting resources or guidance you might need, um, including equity guidance, financial constraint guidance, and then our project selection resource web map. Um, so before turning over to Nick, um, just want to talk a bit about generally speaking, uh, what you should keep in mind as you're filling out the application, especially the evaluation criteria. So for our evaluation criteria, what we're really asking you to do is really build a clear picture and understanding of what the project is or what it, why the project is needed, uh, what the project is, and then how the project addresses those needs. So um, here we are asking you to kind of keep in mind that there are actual people reading this. So don't cut and paste between sections, but just make sure that the goal here is to make sure that we can really understand what's happening and what is in the scope of the project. Um, for uh, building a clear scope of work, uh, data and any other supporting information that might be helpful is really good here. Um, you can use maps and photos to illustrate where your project is to once again help us really clearly understand what it is. Um, and when you do submit your, your attachments, um, it's really helpful for us if you let us know where in the attachment we should be looking at. Um, so we know um, it's not just the entire comp plan, but you're looking at this specific policy or this part of the design might be helpful. Um, we also, as with all our project selection processes, do not do any outside resource uh, research. So whatever you submit is what we will be using when evaluating your project. So I wouldn't assume that um, we'll be able to find out any information that isn't included. Um, so I'll stop there. And so Jennifer or Mitch or anyone who's been through this before, do you have anything to add here about um, helpful tips? Yeah. Not so far, Sarah. Okay. Great. Then I will turn it over to Nick. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, let me share my screen real quick. There we go. Um, great. So everyone should be seeing the TAP website now. And while I'm at it, I will just copy a link into the chat so everyone can access it there. So if you just Google PSRC TAP, um, you should be able to find this website um, pretty quickly. So our website has a brief description of the program and uh, the process underway. Uh, the resources and materials though are down here. Uh, I'll start first with the 2023 Call for Projects material and resources. And under here, we have a few different things of interest. So first we have the schedule. Uh, Sarah just showed this in her presentation. Though if you need a reminder about certain deadlines or where we're at in the process, you can quickly open up this document and see uh, what's going on. Next, we have the project selection workshop. Uh, right now, this just has a link to uh, this Zoom meeting. Uh, but just as a reminder, we are recording this presentation. I think I saw a few questions in the Q&A recording this presentation and demonstration, and it will be available at this uh, link pretty shortly. Next, we have the TAP eligibility document. 
So this is similar to what Sarah overviewed. It describes eligible project sponsors here and a few project sponsors that are ineligible. And then further down, it describes eligible project categories and certain things that fit into those categories. Um, and at the very bottom here is a list of non-eligible projects. So uh, next on the list is our evaluation criteria. Uh, this is a, a bigger document, has an introduction here that talks a bit about the policy focus of this program. And then the whole document follows this outline provided here in this table, where part one describes the criteria for all projects and overviews support for centers and project readiness in the financial plan, where part two uh, overviews category specific policy criteria. So I'll just kind of briefly scroll through this to give you a sense of what this document looks like. So here is part one, the criteria for all projects. The first uh, criterion here is our support for centers, which is worth 30 points. And these two bullets here are what we are looking for in your responses. So we're hoping to see, describe how the project will support the existing and planned housing slash employment densities in the center, and to describe how the project will support the development slash redevelopment plans and activities of the center. And underneath these criteria are examples of uh, how we will score these projects. So we give an overview of what type of projects will receive a high score here, type of responses will receive a medium score and which will receive low, followed by some pretty detailed guidance on how to get the best score possible and what information we would like to see here. And I won't go through the rest of these in that level of detail, but you can see the bullets are listed out here, as well as examples of high, medium, and low scoring and guidance for each of these different criteria. I'll just scroll down to give you a sense of how much information is here. There's a lot of good reading. Um, get to the bottom here and there's a few links. I will be showing the PSRC displacement risk map later, but it is under the guidance for our equity questions. Uh, great, should give a pretty good overview. So next is our financial constraint guidance. And essentially what this does is provide definitions for secured and reasonably expected funds, including the necessary requirements here and examples of each of these. Uh, Jennifer or Mitch, do you have anything to add related to this um, guidance? Uh, oh, go ahead, Mitch. Um, so this is, if you've ever submitted a TIP application to PSRC, this is the same guidelines as um, we follow for those applications. So we're really looking for um, funding that you can uh, give us documentation that it's secured, which is usually in the form of a local TIP or CIP. Um, and if it's federal funding, we're looking for grant award letters. Um, and we just need to see that the funds are um, available to the agency for that project. Um, and if they are reasonably expected, then we're looking to see if see that the funds um, are available and the pro the steps needed for or, sorry, the steps that need to be taken by the agency to secure the funds for the particular project. Jennifer, go ahead if you have anything to add. Oh, that was great. Thanks, Mitch. Okay, thank you both. Um, so after the financial constraint guidance, we get into our equity guidance document, which is quite densely packed with resources. Um, right here is some guidance for section one of the equity guidance. So our equity guidance is divided out into three sections, uh, and there are different guidance and resources for each of these sections to help you answer uh, the questions that we ask. So first we provide our interactive web map um, and I'll briefly overview what that is and then jump back to this, uh, this document. So here is our project selection resource web map. Here you'll get an overview of our region 
and say your project is uh, in Kirkland, you could take a look here and explore whether there are regional growth centers here. You can see there's one, or whether there are manufacturing industrial centers. Uh, you can also take a look at other uh, equity related questions like air, folk, air quality focus communities, which are not in Kirkland, but if you zoom out a little bit, you can see many here towards the south. Um, next, we have our opportunity index, and this uh, has a criteria for describing the opportunity for different census tracts as far as development opportunity, opportunity for growth. Next, we have people of color, and there's kind of a simple distinction here whether or not the census tract has above the regional average or below the regional average. And these questions for or these layers for people of color, people with low incomes, persons with disabilities, limited English proficiency could all be very helpful for answering uh, your equity related questions. I'll just click through a few more here and you can see how they light up. Some of these I would recommend only doing uh, one at a time because, as you can see, if you um, start uh, adding more than two or three layers, it can get a little confusing. You can also zoom out by scrolling on your wheel or using these plus minus, um, and the rest should be fairly self-explanatory. There's some additional information up here that you can click on and read about uh, the layer information. Um, and the data used to create this. So back to the equity guidance, I'll scroll down a little bit and we also provide a hyperlink to the transportation system visualization tool, which may help you understand the project area and answer a few of these questions better. This hyperlink will take you right here with an overview of the tool and you can click here to open it. This is another interactive web map with a description of how to use it. Uh, it'll look pretty similar to the previous one I just showed. Uh, you'll navigate the same way here. It has the same general structure for uh, viewing layers. But here you can look at information like public transportation stops and routes, uh, fish passage barriers, uh, and bicycle, bicycle facilities on arterials. Uh, and an important note here is that we have separated out shared use paths on separate right of ways. Um, so if you want to view those, you'll have to activate that and that may fill in um, some gaps you're seeing if you're just looking at the bicycle facilities on arterials. And there is a lot of other helpful information here. Um, we also include the demographic um, and contextual layers that may be helpful for some of the equity guidance in this tool. We also describe in this note here that there are other resources that might help you answer these equity questions uh, outside of the resources that PSRC has developed. And there are quite a few links here to relevant ones. As we scroll down to help answer section three of the equity criteria, we've provided a link to our displacement risk map, which details the risk of displacement in different census tracts throughout the region. This hyperlink right here will take you to this web map or to this web page, uh, which includes another link to explore an interactive report and map. For now, I'll just take a, a look at the interactive map. Uh, and here you can see the different uh, layers. You can select different layers here. This one looks a bit different. And if you want to see the legend, you can click here to see the legend or up here to see a bit in the, on the right pane. So I'll close out of these. And uh, as we scroll down, the equity guidance has a bit more details about these web map data layer, layers, how we created them, what's included in them, um, and some of the uh, other information you can expect to see here. So this is a pretty dense document. After the equity guidance, we have resource documents for screening forms and for applications. So I think both of these documents would be very helpful to have up as you're completing your screening form uh, and then later application. They include a general checklist of all the information that you're going to need to provide, uh, as well as guidance on what we're looking for, some additional hyperlinks to resources, 
uh, it's generally just an overview of what to expect from the screening form and application. Let's kind of briefly scroll through. It's not a ton of text here, so it should be pretty straightforward and give you simply what you need um, to complete the relevant questions. And here is the same application resources. It includes a lot of the checklist from the screening form, uh, though it has a few additional uh, topics you'll be asked about for the application. So that concludes uh, the links here for project materials and resources. Next, I'll talk about uh, the link to the TAP screening form and application portal. So to access the portal, you can uh, click on this link right here and you'll use your web apps username and password, though you will need to add a hashtag at the end of your password. Um, that's a specific requirement for form site. Uh, to access your account. So when you click on this hyperlink right here, it will open up this page and you'll be able to sign in with your username and password. If you have any trouble with it, feel free to reach out to Mitch or I um, with questions. And finally, on the website, there's just a few simple Q&A questions, which I won't really explore in too much detail, but these are just some frequent, frequently asked eligibility questions that we get. So I think that wraps up an overview of the documents and resources available on our website. And now I'm going to go through a mock application here to give you a sense of what it looks like to work through this survey. So when you open it, you'll be presented with this page and you will select whether you're completing an eligibility screening form or grant application. Uh, for this example, we're assuming that I already completed my eligibility screening form and I'm going back in to make edits and add additional responses for the grant application. So first you'll be asked to provide general project information like your project title, regional transportation ID, or if that's not ap applicable, you'll input NA. You'll list the sponsoring agency, co-sponsors if that's necessary, and you will indicate whether or not you have certification acceptance status from WASHDOT. And if not, you will need to um, provide uh, your CA sponsor. Next, you'll provide the relevant contact information for the project. So a name, phone number, and email will suffice. Then you will describe your project scope and the justification need or purpose for this project. This is the point where it's good to remind folks that we're asking for clear and concise descriptions around 300 words or less. Um, we're looking for a complete description of your project scope and justification, uh, but not necessarily a whole uh, book about your project. Next, we're asking for the project location uh, to help identify where it is. So we'll ask for street, route, trail names, anything to identify here. And then you'll identify which county your project is located in. If it happens to be a multi-county project, you can select multiple. For now, I just have King selected. Then you'll indicate landmarks at the beginning and end of your project and upload any maps, graphics, relevant information that will help us identify the project location. Here's plan consistency, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, you'll need to describe whether it was identified in a local comprehensive plan. And then if yes, you'll need to describe where, in what plan, and what section, and what are the page numbers. And if no, you'll need to describe how it's um, consistent with the applicable local comprehensive plan. Next, you'll need to indicate the federal functional classification. We have a drop down here um, with a variety of options for your federal functional classification. And the next question is regarding support for centers. So Sarah overviewed these criteria in her presentation, but you'll need to describe how the project supports uh, the existing housing and employment densities in the center and how it supports the development redevelopment plans at the center. Next, you will indicate which category your project is in. So you will select either bicycle and pedestrian project, historic resources project, or environmental project depending on which category your project falls into. And that will branch you off in different directions in the survey. 
Uh, for now, I've selected pedestrian and bicycle projects, so we'll be, we'll be looking at the process for that. So here are our first grouping of category-specific criteria for bicycle or pedestrian and bicycle projects. You'll need to provide a variety of descriptions on the criteria that we've overviewed. Um, and then once you're complete with this section, you'll move on to the equity section. And this is where I mentioned earlier, there are different subsections of our equities uh, criteria. So section one will be about the populations being served by your projects. Section two will ask about your public outreach process. And section three will ask about the displacement risk of the project area and what actions uh, are being taken to mitigate displacement risk. Need to add a couple of big responses there. Next, we have safety and security. And here are a few more criteria questions. And that will bring us to PSRC funding requests. You'll indicate whether the project has received PSRC funds previously and provide the TIP ID. Here is a continuation of that in which you'll identify the phases for which funding is being requested, the amount and your expected year of obligation, whether that's 2024 or 2025 or 2026. Uh, there's some additional information here. Uh, but you'll just select in these drop downs uh, the relevant phase, year, and enter your amount. It's important to note you won't include commas or decimal points, and then you can calculate it for your total funding request. Similar here, we have the total estimated project cost and schedule. So this is looking beyond your funding request here, but describing the whole project estimated project cost and schedule for its planning phase, preliminary engineering design phase, right of way phase, construction, and any other phases. Uh, and you will provide some information about the project summary down here. Next, we'll have financial documentation. And Mitch, if you wanna uh, offer a few words about this, that'd be great. Yeah, um, so similar, to what I mentioned previously and what we look for in our regular monthly tip amendments. This is the point at which you'll upload your financial documentation. Um, so when you are um, applying for TAP funds, you will need to demonstrate that you have secured um, local match for the fund or for the phase. Um, that you're applying for. And so this is where you'll show, uh, you'll attach a local TIP or CIP document showing those funds um, available for this project. Um, and if there's any other uh, grant awards or federal funding related to, that's um, going to be used for the phase um, or, and or project in general for this that you're applying to, or sorry, that was really poorly said. Um, if you're uh, using federal funds, such as another state or state or federal funds, um, state or federal grants, um, you will want to uh, attach award letters here. Um, so that can be, so that would include um, grants for anything in the phase that you are applying for or previous phases that you will be programming. Um, as a result of um, obtaining this award. And remind me, Nick, uh, I haven't done as much with Farmsite. Can they attach multiple files or yeah. does it have to be one? They should be able to attach multiple files. Okay, great. Okay, I'll go to the next. Um, we have project readiness. If you wanna say a few words about this as well, Mitch. Yeah, so here we are looking to ensure that you are, that the milestones for your project are logical and that there's no risk of delaying um, obligation of our awarded funds. So essentially we want to ensure that the PE phase is being started and completed prior to the right of way phase and prior to the construction phase. Um, this is important because we just, don't want to risk um, 
sponsors delaying their actual obligation and missing the deadline of our awarded top funds. Um, so we'll just be making, we may reach out and ask questions if we, if it appears that um, some of these milestones look like they're a little too close to each other um, and just verify that you're aware of that. Great. Uh, so I'll kind of click through that, um, ask for environmental documentation as well, right of way information, construction. And finally, we have our last criteria section, which is our other considerations. And as a reminder, these aren't scored in our points, um, but could help with final decision making. So we have a few questions here about other considerations we should take into account. And finally, we'll have, uh, this is just a final review section, and here you will submit your screening form or application when it's complete. Uh, and I probably ran through that very quickly. There's a lot of information to throw your way, um, but if you have any questions about our documents and resources uh, or the application and form site, feel free to reach out to Sarah and I, to Sarah or I with those questions. Um, I think I can stop my share now and we can start Q&A. Great, thanks Mitch. <clears throat> so I'll turn it to Jennifer, looks like we received some questions. We have, so I'm just sorting through these last couple. Um, okay, so we have a few questions. We have one question about eligibility. And uh, this specifically asks if bicycle infrastructure connecting a cruise terminal to a regional trail would be eligible. Um, I, Sarah, I think you could answer that question and maybe sure. revisit kind of where those resources again to confirm eligibility. Sure, um, so I would say yes, <laughs> this is, it would be eligible. Um, so the only trail projects that would not be eligible is if they are only providing uh, circulation within an area, within a closed loop, uh, within a park, for example. But if they're connecting between two different destinations, in this case, a regional uh, a cruise terminal and a regional trail, then that would be eligible. And, um, and as Jennifer mentioned, there's more information and in our eligibility resources, which also linked to the uh, FHWA's uh, TAP resources, which has even more information about any in eligibility questions. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we have a question about functional classification. Is there any requirement that a project be on a federally classified roadway? Uh, and I will answer that question. <laughs> The uh, so the the federal functional classification is a requirement for projects for roadway projects that receive uh, federal funds, and so the, the the functional classification is a process is a federal designation that an agency has to go through uh, to receive that designation. However, exceptions to project to um, to the requirement for federal functional classification includes bicycle and pedestrian projects. So many of the projects that would be submitted and probably most of the projects that would be submitted for TAP actually are an exception to that requirement. Uh, there could be possibly maybe depending on the project, if it is you know, within a corridor, a roadway corridor that might, de depending on what the scope elements are, there may be some questions there. So I would say in that case, that's very unique situation. So if there's, if you have any question about uh, the fun functional classification requirement for your specific project, just reach out to us and we will work with you to verify that. But bicycle and pedestrian projects are um, an exception to functional classification requirements. Yeah, and I will mention there is one type of roadway project which is eligible for TAP funds, and that is roadway projects within the former right of way of a highway or where they're creating a boulevard in a former right of way. Um, so that is why we included that in the screening checklist. We don't get, a, I don't know that we've ever gotten an application for that, but that is one type of roadway which uh, you might be able to apply for with the TAP funds. Okay. And um, but yeah, we can uh, we can definitely evaluate on a case by case basis depending on what we get because there might be some exceptions to that. 
We also have a question about the center's criteria. Uh, the question is, is there a buffer around the center? What if the project is near a center within a UGA serving a transportation needs of a center, uh, but not within the borders of a center? Um, do you want to answer that, Sarah, or do you want me to? Sure. Yeah, I will try to answer that. And then uh, if you have anything to add, uh, please feel free. Um, so we, this is a really good question about what counts um, as a center and whether a project serves a center. So generally speaking, corridors that serve a center would be considered as supporting the center if you're able to build a case that they do support the center. So we don't have, um, as far as I know, any kind of buffer built in, kind of prescribed mileage from the center. But what we're asking for is that in your application, you would be able to identify the center served and then also um, describe how the project would serve the center. And a, a way you could do this is by looking at the comprehensive plan for that center or that area um, and looking for any policies which may be there for uh, connections to a center and looking at how the project might support that. Since for this criteria, we're specifically looking for how the project supports identified policies or plans and then also um, employment housing activity. So um, yeah, Jennifer, does that, uh, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, it's just, you definitely want to make your case of how, how you're serving the center if the project is located out of it, but that is a, that is a valid eligible um, project if it's serving. All right, we have a lot, we have a handful of financial questions, so I was just going through to see, <laughs> to, to get the, the non-financial ones first. Um, so, uh, th there's a few questions about what is considered fully funded. Um, like one of the questions is, is a project fully funded if it has the local funds for match but needs the TAP funds? And the answer, so I'll start with that because that actually is, the answer is yes. So if uh, for whatever phase you're requesting, you're requesting TAP funds, you have local funds to basically fill out the rest of the funding for that, that would be considered fully funded. You know, if you received TAP funds, you have the local match to fully fund the phase, yes, that would be considered fully funded. Um, and so the and I want to talk a little bit, and Mitch, maybe you can talk about this too, about what th there's there's a question about if we don't, if there are there other funding sources supplementing to get to a fully funded phase. Um, and the answer to that is that that is on the sponsor to identify all of the funds outside of the funding request that are going to be uh, put toward fully funding the phase. So uh, as, as Mitch mentioned, sometimes, another uh, state or federal grant has been secured. And so that can that can go to that, um, to fully funding the phase. Uh, the, there is also, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, but yeah, so the, the local funds would have to go, the, the 13 and a half percent match requirement is a minimum requirement for non-federal funds. Some requests, have exactly a 13 and a half percent match, depending on the request on the project. The match can certainly be more than 13 and a half percent. It just can't be less than that. Uh, so it, it is up to the sponsor to identify uh, the other sources of funding that have been secured or are reasonably expected. And, and Mitch, I, I think we should talk a little bit more about what we mean by reasonably expected for, for funds. Uh, particularly with local funds, because we do realize that particularly if a project hasn't received any funding yet, uh, it may not, you may not have a local tip that shows that the funds are full, are secured yet for that project. And we do have a, uh, a process, a, a series of, of steps that we want you to describe to us in that case of how the funds would go from a budget to being secured. And, and when you make that case, that that's what we're looking for with uh, reasonably expected funds. So Mitch, I don't know, do you have anything you wanna add on reasonably expected or anything that I just said? Yeah, with the reasonably really expected, um, another pretty common scenario is where the um, sponsor will show the local funds and kind of like a general fund or bucket, um, not necessarily um, designated towards the uh, necessary project. And 
what we would want to see is the amount is equal to or greater than the amount we or you will need to um, meet or yeah, obtain fully funding uh, or full funding um, and also steps and timelines of like when and how those funds will be allocated to that specific project in the future uh, by the time the obligation deadline is set. And something that we see that does not meet our requirements for reasonably expected are unsecured grants. So some sometimes we see kind of a pitch that we're going to go for this other grant and with and we have a really good chance for it. And with that, we would fully fund the phase. That is not considered, that doesn't meet our, our threshold for reasonably expected. So uh, it is certainly uh, fine if what usually happens in that situation is that the sponsor needs to show that there are enough local funds available to kind of cover the balance besides what the um, what the funding the tap funding request is uh, you can still go for these other these grants from these other sources uh, but and and in that case if say you won tap funding you made your case that you have enough local funds to cover it if that's what's needed that would be programmed in the tip if later on you secured an, another source of funds for that project you could still you could basically swap out the local funds for for your new award but for our purposes future grants no matter how good your chance do not count as reasonably expected it, we do need to show that there's enough other sources of funds to to meet the the match basically looking to see if there are other there's a question about the set aside this is a federal set aside uh the question has to do with the sizes of city there's no um there's no requirements for large above there's no thresholds for the size of agency requesting um tap funds so even though this is a federal set aside of um of funds that that did come out of the federal transportation um act it's not uh there there's no like it's not our award or our consideration is not can, is not related to any uh jurisdiction size Let's see. Oh, okay. Somebody asked in the screening form, uh, do we enter TAP PSRC as unsecured? And yes, that is that is commonly what we see. So we see when, you, when you're filling out that form, that portion of your application or your screening form, actually. So the TAP funds list whatever the request is, list the other funds of sources that would fully uh, fund and, and the amounts to fully fund the phase. The tap at that point is unsecured. Perfectly fine to put that in your in your application for your non-tap matching funds. Then you would either list those as secured, in which case we would want to see the documentation that the funds are secured, or you could list those funds as reasonably expected. In that case, we want to see the documentation to show that they're reasonably expected. There's a question about phases. If TAP was received for design phase of a project, could an agency now apply for TAP for construction? Uh, yes, the answer is <laughs> you, you can apply in different competitions for different phases. So if you received funds in a, for an early phase of a project, it's moved along and you're now ready to request funds for a later phase of a project, uh, yes, that is allowed. Yeah, looks like we have a related question. Um, if STP, STBG funds have already been awarded to a phase, can that same phase receive TAP funds? I think the answer is yes, but we need to double check. Yeah, I think I need to double check on that because if a project yeah. should be, um, I mean, if a project has received funds in the past, it is programmed in our TIP as fully funded. And uh, Mitch, do you know the answer for, to that? We may have to get back on that one. Yeah. I kind of thought it was no. I think it's no. Um, okay. yeah. unless, it's, <laughs> unless it's like segmented, right? Right, right. Yeah. Which is a little different. Yes, yeah. So if you have a big project and you have requested funds for, you've like phased it into a phase one and phase two and requested funds for phase one, then you can, um, 
you are allowed to request funds for, say, the other segment of the project. Sorry, we use phase a lot, unfortunately, in our um, in our world. So in this case, we're talking about segmenting a project where you might have a first half that you do first and then a second half that you do later. Um, in that case, you could uh, apply for funds for both sides of that. But um, but once once a phase has been funded, PSRC funds, I believe that is that that is it for that phase. Yeah, for that one, I'll just know um, the this question. We're happy to follow up, but if you could just add uh, your name and contact information because it just says uh, that person signed in as anonymous, so we can get back to you. But if you could add that, it would be helpful. And I guess that also just if there's any question in just overall about eligibility or about the funds that you are uh, as part of why we do the screening form so that we can go through that process and do that review and make sure that everybody's squared away with uh, both the federal rules and our rules. Um, and we give that feedback early in the process uh, so that that can then inform the project moving forward into its application. Uh, but Aside from the screening form and getting our review comments back on that, you are also um, welcome to reach out to our staff and we can answer specific questions about specific projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great point. But uh, that's what where our screening form really comes in handy when we can uh, look into those questions ahead of time before you submit the full application. Let's see. Okay, looks like we got another one. For a project that requires um, temporary construction easement, if it's a right-of-way phase with WashDOT, it's a right-of-way phase with us. And so generally that is considered a right-of-way phase. If there's something specific to your project where you and WashDOT agree something is part of construction, then that would, uh, but I, I think this is often a question for WashDOT, but in general, temporary easements are a right-of-way phase and get counted as a right-of-way phase in our. Let's see. Do you see any others? That... Um, no, I think we've got all of them. Um, yeah, we have a few minutes left. Oh, okay. Thank you for uh, providing your contact information. Okay, great. So we will follow up uh, with the attendee who asked the question about uh, TAP and STP funds. Okay, so we have we have until noon. So if you have any questions, looks like we have uh, one more coming in. And as Jennifer said, uh, we are happy to talk offline. Um, I don't know if, I think we put our contact information. It's on It's on the TAP webpage. You can contact me. Um, and if I can't answer your question, I can turn it to Jennifer or Mitch to, uh, or Nick to uh, help with that. We're waiting for a question that we're told <laughs> is coming. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So we have a question on design. Okay, so I'll just read it out. Uh, we just started a design project funded with FHWA design grant. We plan to advertise and construct in 2025. We should have 30% design plans by the time we submit an application. Is this something that would work? That seems like that should work. Our funds are for 25 and 26. So, um... So yeah, I mean, you don't have to have one phase finished before you apply for funding for a later phase, but we do look at the milestones and, uh, and some of the, the project readiness that Mitch was talking about is 
uh, not about you have to have one thing completed before you ask for the next. Although many agencies do take that, do apply that strategy. I mean, the more, you know, the farther you, into, you are in design, the more you know about your project. Uh, but that kind of timeline would work with the funding that we're talking about as long as the milestones that you provide kind of line up and, and make sense uh, for the timeline that you're on. Thanks, Jennifer. I think we answered all the questions. Um, there's a question about if a project is fully funded, if it has local funds. Did we get to this one? Okay. Sorry, say that again, Sarah. Is a project fully funded if it has the local funds for the match but needs the TAP funds? Yes, and so. I did answer that before and the answer is it would be yes. Okay. Great, then I think um, we have gone through everything, but please feel free to reach out anytime as you fill out your screening form. Um, but we'd like to thank everybody for attending today um, and give us your time and hope everyone has a great long weekend. Enjoys, there's not really any sunshine, but <laughs> maybe at some point this weekend there'll be sunshine. So, but uh, thank you to our panelists. Um, and I think we can end there. Any, anything to add? All right, last remarks. All right, if not, if any other questions, please, uh, like I said, reach out. Uh, we have our contact information. Thank you. Thank you all.